It is a great pleasure. We've been living up to this, to the grand finale of our conference today, and to Emily Savage-Smith having the major task to summarize the magnificent overviews we've been given here during the day. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Emily. Please help me join, join me in welcoming her. Heavens, that's very good of you. I have to put some glasses on to see if I can read any of my notes I made. Uh, we have actually, uh, all of us, I think, uh, enjoyed really five excellent talks. Now, I don't think it's my position particularly to summarize those because I'm, I think we all can remember many things of them. So what I will do is just give a few uh, sort of reflections on them as a group. And then I'm, ho I'm hoping that that will stimulate some more discussion so we can have an end on a discussion rather than just listening to me blither on. Now, we've heard five talks about basically four cultures, you might say. Uh, China, New World, Maya and Aztec, medieval Europe, and medieval Islam. But of course, med medieval Islam is really a very rich mix of uh, Greek antiquity, Persian um, culture, and with a very large input from India as well. Uh, so I thought I might, um, as I was sitting there listening to these talks, talk, think about the similarities between the different cultures that we've heard and, and the differences, which are sometimes more fun than the similarities. But uh, starting with the similarities, uh, we, this is all all of these cultures had only naked eye astronomy. This is all before the introduction of the telescope. And in fact, they pushed naked eye astronomy to its absolute limits, particularly in the 18th century observatories in Jaipur, for example, that were mentioned by Benno van Dalen in the very last talk. Those are quite remarkable. They're quite huge instruments because they were trying to improve the the accuracy of the observations they were making. And that leads me to say that I was a little disappointed for my own interests. I would have liked a little more discussion about the instrumentation that, were being, that was being used for these various observations in the different cultures. Um, I might suggest another conference, actually, in which we could employ instruments and study, see the instruments in the History of Science Museum here, which is a remarkable collection and to really talk about how they used instruments to make some of these observations. We've seen pictures of astrolabes, but of course, you could not use a handheld astrolabe to make a serious astronomical observation. Uh, they're simply not large enough to be graduated enough, uh, and of course, there's also the movement with a handheld instrument, uh, to produce um, observations to, that will give you uh, not only the degree, but the second and minutes. And you simply can't get those off of a handheld astrolabe. You can't even get very far with a very large astrolabe. You have to have other instruments. And um, one of the basic, besides the sextant, which was mentioned, and which is very, very important, um, another very major instrument was the observational um, armillary sphere, as, the, as you British say, armillary, as Americans say. Um, and much to my regret, I inquired a few years back, and as far as I can tell, there is not one medieval, or earlier, observational armillary sphere that is preserved today in a museum. They were huge instruments, and they had to be large, but they apparently produced remarkably could be two accurate readings. And it would be fun to have a session to explore that kind of, of material and how the data was obtained, basically. Uh, but <coughs> in the case of the New World, Mayan um, uh, culture, we know that they use, or apparently, no instrumentation at all. They were simply observing the appearance of the first rising and last sighting of <laughs> Venus at the horizon. Uh, so that's only horizon astronomy, you might say. Yet, 
they had the sophistication to have a place marker for zero in their numerical system, which is, is I think, completely amazing. So, uh, another similarity of all the societies is that there is no, at, the, at that time, there was essentially no dichotomy between science and religion. Hence, astrology and divination were a part of astronomical activity. Uh, another similarity is that all of these cultures use their astronomy, if not primarily, quite certainly most of the time, for computing calendars. Uh, that was extremely important. And then in, within a religious context, uh, they obviously, in, in the, uh, Europe, you had the computers, the uh, ways of computing the Easter and various days in a movable religious calendar, and in Islam, the prayer times and other uh, very important uh, uh, days in the religious calendar. In all of these cultures, astronomy was a major role in agriculture. Uh, they, it could be used to determine times of sowing and harvesting, uh, when to move the flocks. In a, 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 in the, a, this is true in the Mayan culture again. Uh, we s were told that it, uh, astronomy was important in determining uh, rain and when the maize crops would um, be at their height and so on. Uh, Pre-Islamic pre Bedouin culture had a fairly sophisticated way of mapping the skies into what they called, what we call rather, lunar mansions. Um, and again, this was used as a way of determining the changing seasons and when it was time to move your flocks and your, and your family to someplace else. All of these cultures used astronomy in their architecture in one way or another for orienting buildings. And you can see that run through the whole thing. Um, of course, the, the Qibla we saw particularly illustrated in the case of Islam, but all of these cultures seem to have uh, used um, astronomy and then, of course, also the, the four uh, uh, directions of the compass, for, which raises another issue of compass, but anyway, uh, for orienting buildings. And then astronomy was important in the development of geography. Uh, this is particularly true in the Greek and Islamic cultures where you had um, very organized and serious uh, and repeated attempts at determining the, um, the, basically the circumference of the earth. Obviously, they're not going to determine the circumference of the earth in cultures such as China and, and uh, the New World where they thought the earth was flat. Uh, Again, astro um, astronomy plays a very large role in the development of geodesy that's connected with the determination of the, your position on the Earth, and development of coordinate systems, cartography in general, and then, of course, navigation on both land and sea. And uh, when, of course, the compass then ultimately became able, that is added to the, uh, what you can learn through astronomical observations. And finally, of course, all of these cultures, as I said, did use uh, and, and felt necessary uh, to have astrological um, uh, prognostications, uh, a major function of the uh, interest in astronomy. And differences. Uh, the obvious major differences are between uh, China and uh, the Mayan cultures. The Mayan culture, of course, is so cut off uh, in a way that China was not. China, as we, as we heard, um, uh, did have some contacts with India uh, later on uh, with uh, the Mongol invasion and so on. Um, and yet both cultures were felt, um, not, neither one of them felt or believed that the earth was round. And I thought, we, I, for me, one of the most um, enjoyable moments was of that quite fascinating discourse on um, the reasons which all Europeans and uh, people in the southern Medi uh, uh, Mediterranean rim all around would have known uh, for why the Earth is round, and then to see some reason why that was not accepted uh, is still difficult to believe uh, for me uh, in China. 
and of course, uh, apparently in the um, uh, New World as well, there was no, uh, I gather, no um, even discussion of the Earth uh, being round. And perhaps it's possible that we simply have become so accustomed to that idea as ourselves that we forget how difficult an idea it is to accept, even though we have been taught, some of us in schools, that the medieval world, everyone thought it was flat. And I thought, again, I appreciated the reminder that it is absolutely untrue, um, that there are historians, myself being one, feel that the uh, myth <laughs> that medieval Europe thought the earth was flat was due to an American novelist <laughs> by the name of Washington Irving who wrote a three-volume, best-selling at the time, um, historical biography of Christopher Columbus. It was enormously popular uh, at that time. And in it, there is the scene of Christopher Columbus uh, saying at the court that he is go out and he's going to prove that he knows the earth to be round, but everybody else knew it was, was flat. And it's, it's a literary joke, really, um, that has become embedded in uh, European education, I think, um, to an extraordinary extent. I, I can't think of another piece of literature that has produced such an error in the uh, thinking of modern European thinkers. Anyway, uh, so I, those are the major differences I see. Also, the, 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 the tables, I was interested, you don't, in the Mayan or New World, material, I didn't think you had what I would call a, a table of, uh, perhaps I'm wrong because I can't, of course, read a single word of any of that. Um, but certainly the Greeks and, and the, uh, scholars within the Islamic world love to make tables, astronomical tables, and they're very important. And as, again, uh, Ben Dominic was saying at the end there, they are, many of them, calculated. It isn't that somebody has stood there and made every one of those observations. They become generated through mathematical um, procedures. And uh, I would be interested in knowing if the tables that are in China are generated. I mean, it sounds as if they are very, very similar to what was in the Islamic world, but I was, I was not altogether clear on that. Um, but I am, the, 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 my cynical mind made me, reminded me of tables of ge what's called geomantic uh, divination, it's a type of divination that you can have, where people became so obsessed in the 16th, 17th century particularly, that they would take one table, uh, and these are, it's, I'd have to show you a picture, but anyway, it's a, a non-algebraic um, abelian group. That, uh, with a representation of dots. And someone came up with the idea that you could take a table of those and you could do certain maneuvers with it and generate a whole new table. And then they were so intrigued by that that they did more uh, maneuvers, same thing, and they found that if you did five generated tables, one from the other, you ended up with one that was absolutely identical to what you started with, and that seemed to please them immensely. But from a divinatory standpoint, it made no sense at all because you didn't have any different reading at the end of the day than what you started with. All of which is a, a rather boring way of saying I'm, all, <laughs> I'm slightly suspicious of endless, endless tables that get generated and I, I'd like to see where it goes back, at what points new observations are being, in, being introduced into the generation of those, of those tables. Um, <coughs> We've heard quite a bit at the, uh, in the last lecture about astronomy uh, in the Islamic world and its uh, influence, its spread uh, throughout uh, most of the inhabited world, actually, at that time, other than the New World. And uh, Professor Bandalan again, ended with a, a very cautious and, I thought, thoughtful evaluation of Copernicus's possible knowledge of the planetary models that were devised in the 13th century Miragra school. Um, I've always been 
myself a little, oh, more than a little, reluctant to <coughs> accept that, except in the history of science, there, has a, there is a principle that you can see at play at a, a number of points. And that is that the shorter the time between identical discoveries or uh, theories, um, as in the case, say, of calculus with Leibniz and Newton, the shorter the time, the more likely that they are simultaneous, uh, independent discoveries or theories. But the longer the time, the more likely it is that the, it is a case of direct borrowing or, um, or direct transmission. And I, I do think that in comparison with other somewhat similar um, incidents, I, I think the balance is in the, uh, probably it is a, a borrowing over a period of time. We simply haven't discovered and may never know the mechanism, the actual mechanism by which it moved from one uh, area to become available to Copernicus. Now, I've just about run out of things to say. I would very much like to open this up to discussion. Maybe I'll add one more other, one other sentence. And then I, th I think we can only wonder how European science uh, might have developed without the infusion of Islamic science and the whole history of other sciences that it brought with it. Um, it's a, quite a theory, quite, quite a, a, a thought to think about how European science would have developed had it been based upon a Chinese notion of the uh, uh, flat earth. Anyway, uh, are there any questions? history of any subject, but today with astronomy, maybe you astronomy, that I'm always concerned that we we still, as much as we try not to, have a look at it in the context of ourselves, our modern understanding. And I always wonder if we're missing something sometimes because, I mean, you heard the case in the news where a young lad picked up a book the other day and tried to swipe it because he couldn't turn the page. <laughs> the tablet. Um, we all have our modern terms of reference. And as much as we try not to do it, even as I try and do it as an amateur story, try and wipe the slate clean, try. But I always find myself being judgmental, asking why, why do they do that? That's silly, because when you think you actually work through it, you realise that actually probably it isn't silly. You know, we judge the idea of a flat earth people of the time. But unless you actually understand the geometry of what people have done, you, you could almost turn into a Trumpism and call it propaganda. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm not saying I'm dependent flat of course I'm strong. <coughs> Much just a comment, really. I don't know what you think about that. What do you think? Well, I, I think we all, um, every historian, we, 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 you have to look at the world through what eyes you've been given. What you, what you need to do and to be reminded by other people is that there are other views, there are other perspectives, and you, and you keep trying your, your level best to try to understand uh, a different perspective on the material, but you'll never get it right. I mean, you're never going to be there at that time understanding, and even then, even if you were, yeah, there are different views, life is complex, and we just have to do the best we can. It's what, what keeps historians in business, of course, because we keep revising someone else's earlier approach because they haven't looked at it from such and such a view, and it keeps us busy. But it's impossible. we can't ever write a definitive um, history. We can't write a definitive understanding of what went on at another time and place. We can't even write a definitive discussion of what actually occurred here today because it would only be what I wrote down. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I particularly enjoyed um, what you had to say about instruments. And it made me wonder if I might ask you what you think about a distinction 
or the distinction between theory and practice in astronomy. Now we had a, a bit of discussion at the beginning of the day where uh, Dr. Gaspar put up the, the quotation from Petrus Alfonsi talking about practice, and there was some discussion about whether practice could mean observation or whether it could mean uh, you know, the use of tables or the use of instruments and so on. Uh, and whether it's therefore helpful to have a distinction between theory and practice and what such a distinction might look like um, when we're talking about um, you know, uh, models uh, or instruments as models or instruments as practical tools or astrology and where is there a, is there a line to be drawn, is there a blurred boundary and, and how helpful do you think that contact could be? Very much a blurred ba a boundary. Every, the whole notion of practice versus theory runs through not just astronomy. I mean, you see this in discussions in medicine, which is my other life, and the, um, the literature is full of it. Did, uh, was someone a practitioner? You take Ibn Sina, a hot debate amongst people now. Did Ibn Sina actually ever practice medicine, even though he wrote the canon of medicine, which was dominated European ed medical education for, for several centuries, actually? Um, and, they, and writers talk about it themselves. Um, but there is, there is, there is a difference, between, in my view, in the case of, a, of, a, of astro astronomy, astrology too, for that matter, um, of someone who comes up with a new geometrical, mathematical uh, explanation of a movement of a body. They can come up with a new one that might accommodate it with less offense to the simplicity of the original Aristotelian uh, concept. Um, but to make that mathematical adjustment does not require you to actually have spent any time looking at the skies. And in, in, in terms of medicine, you get people who write incredible theories, and they'll, they'll tell you, they'll give you whole theories about a, a disease and what you do with it. And these become what we historians of science again call thought, thought experiments. And it's very, very hard to distinguish a thought experiment from when someone is actually doing anything. But the writer himself feels the need to say that he's doing something. <clears throat> so it's, the world is very complicated. <laughs> it's very, but anyway, it, it, the whole notion of theory and practice runs through all of this literature that I've seen anyway. Surely the, the classic case of what you just said is, is Newton. Mm. Um, there's no evidence that I know of that he ever <coughs> did any significant amount of practical astronomy. Um, he, of course, did the famous experiment with the um, mm. dispersion of light, the prisms and so on. Yeah, the Borodin experiment. Yeah. He invented uh, a form of reflecting telescope, though he was not the first sure. to do that. Um, <coughs> but there's, I, I don't believe there's any evidence that, uh, that he was any mm. sort of a practical astronomer. I don't think there yes, was. I mean, he completely revised mm. magnetic astronomy fundamentally. Mm. 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 Well, not practically looking around the moon to see whether Rob Island is still here to answer that one. <clears throat> no, let's quickly move on to the next question. Yeah, I um, have something, a question. It's really. A, I, think, in, I think the speaker is trying to a, a point that you made about instruments. You started off by yeah. saying um, how did um, um, the Mayan Aztec civilization or Chinese civilization manage without instruments? I think the first thing to say is you need quite simple instruments to predict the year based on the equinoxes because that, what was done in uh, Britain with um, our sort of ancient instruments which were you know, large stone, one was like Stonehenge and, and, and stone barrows and this sort of thing. So you can do that in the first place. Um, obviously with big pyramids, big structures like that, you can track any kind of alignments that you want. I think the key though to uh, we, we started, I started off mentioning Stonehenge, that was quite a simple sort of society, it didn't have an elaborate society. Um, and if we take uh, the societies that had writing in um, the uh, Mayan civilization in China, what they used for the instrument was in fact this system of cycles. So they had a repeating system of months or units of a particular length. If they followed those over a long period, they were able to project them back you know, presumably to times that went before their written record, and forward, 
then they can measure the position of the planets over a period of time. So that was their instrument in using um, the, the year to um, make the kind of measurements that they would have had, that they would have needed to make. So I think we can be too obsessed because we're in a kind of scientific page where we get sort of instruments left by the centre that we think you can't do anything about them. And I think they could, that's number one. Number two, the second point you made was about the spherical Earth. Well, really, that came out of Ptolemaic discoveries, didn't it? It came out of that science. Yes. Uh, well, I think we were getting it. I don't think we had it. I think independently had that science going through the yeah, going through Islam. I don't think we had a separate uh, source of that um, that kind of system that came from other than from that original source that had spread out um, originally across the whole early world. But I'm not sure about that. But mm. that's all I can say that we had the benefit of that system, which obviously enables improved accuracy for clinical uh, work. But um, the people who didn't have that, it was obviously the advantage them, but they weren't silly because they didn't have it. They were, they were obviously ignorant. I have a completely harebrained theory about that, but I'll, I'll, I'll let someone. Well, we've got, we've got, uh, do you want to answer that? Um, well, Would you then see uh, there's, there's a comment about the instruments point, if I may, that was uh, earlier in the, the, the point that uh, our, our colleague made up there. Um, just to say, yes, indeed, it's quite true, you can do a lot without complicating graduated instruments. I'd like to just give two examples of my own experience. I spoke earlier about the necessity to actually do naked eye astronomy if you're going to become a historian of it. Um, uh, I found something, to much to my surprise, that uh, one almost instrumentless observation could be remarkably precise. It was uh, a series in certain ancient Chinese texts, there are a list of what are called centered stars. Which I want to say at this time of the year, you will notice this star is centered at dusk, which means you will see it when it first becomes visible at dusk on the meridian. Um, and this star will be the one that should be on the meridian at a certain time later and so on. I tried the experiment um, when I had a balcony, when I was a research fellow at Clare Hall, Clare Hall, Cambridge, a balcony oriented north south, and just erecting a little sight line, a couple of known ones there, due south. And I found to my astonishment that. If I observe fairly regularly on a series of clear nights in the summer, I can actually locate to the day the time when, at dusk, looking south, a star became visible very close to the meridian. It was very obvious in the days before and the days after that it was approaching that point and then gone past it. Hardly any instruments at all, and I could get a precise date in the solar cycle from that, which astonished me. Later I decided, okay, how could they have found so the equivalent in China, the right ascension of stars without That's a graduated circle? Right. And I set up my gnomons again and I made myself a water clock. And I found to my astonishment that by using this water clock, the way that John Steele said the Babylonians used their water clock, where he said it later than I tried it out, I could find the right ascension of stars by simply timing the intervals between their meridian transits mm. to a remarkably high degree of accuracy. No need for any graduated circles at all. It's only when you begin to want to measure mm. degrees up and down the mm. graduations, mm. and there we have signs of that in China from about 70 BC, where there are certain records of north well, pole distances well. that make good sense in, in but, that way. But prior to that then, in a Chinese record, it would be the time, or the, I mean, what would they be putting into the record? Um, a star X seen, do they give a time? Yes, I mean, it, a, day, um, a day? What do they, it, what do they say? Uh, I see, well, what do they record if you saw this star on such and such a date, etc.? Effectively, what they do is to codify those things and say, this, uh, in our official system, we predict that this star or uh, should be seen on the meridian at this date during the solar cycle. In other words, mm. calculating from one winter mm. solstice to the next. And so you get a repertoire of those stars. And I was trying out to see, well, what use are these really? And I was astonished to find that if you look for the culmination at dusk of a particular star, it, it is identifiable to within the day. Uh, but they, what we get in codification of these, saying this is the official list, 
which I thought must be some kind of vague stuff, because how can you, know, you tell exactly when it's on the meridian at dusk and so on? Sorry. So, so you're not getting tables giving coordinates. You're basically, uh, as, you, as you do throughout the Greek and uh, the Islamic system. Uh, later, yes, uh, the second part of what I said was about coordinates, yeah, where people about said, about this stellar lodge, that is the distance between that defining star and the next one, is so many loops, so many degrees. And that was what I was looking for. And I found that with a simple dome on the use of water clock, I could calculate that quite nicely. Even find, of course, where the sun was by time and how long it was from noon. Ladies and gentlemen, I am afraid I have to wrap up proceedings. I know there are more questions in the room. Please join me in thanking Emily for all. Oh,